Hi everyone, welcome to this week's The Recovery. On today's show, we're joined by the amazing Brandon Novak. And I say amazing because it's true. Hi Brandon, how you doing? I'm great, man. I'm great. Thank you for, uh, for taking the time and, and believing that I have something worth adding to your show. You know, I've read your story and I, 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 I've got friends that know you and I know I've had friends that knew what you were like. And there was like, there's this, in London, there's this new generation of skaters. And one of them is a friend of mine called Blondie McCoy. And I said to him that uh, I was having you on here. And he was like, oh, my God, man, so cool, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, he, you've got to have him because it's like, you know, his story is so amazing. And uh, as I say, I, I read your story and it, and it kind of blew me away. And I just thought you were one of the people that I really wanted on the edge. Because when we read someone's book or you read someone's, you know, that their deck about them, it's very, you know, it, 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 it's written in a, in, a, in a true but untrue way in the sense of you want people to read it. It's, it's, you know, and I think that a conversation is so much more revealing. I want you to tell us your story. What was it like as a kid growing up? You know, if you would have asked me, let's say, 30, 60, 90, one year into my sobriety, I would say I had the most fucking traumatic childhood one could experience. Yeah. How dare them subject me to that? But the reality is after doing a lot of internal work on myself, I see it clearly for what it actually was. And it was, it was two people doing the best that they could with what they had, right? And what that looks like is this. My father never held a job a day in his life. He taught me one thing, if and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. Uh, he was a rather unsavory fella, if you will. He ran with the Hells Angels. And, and unfortunately, he is no longer with us due to his addiction of crack cocaine, right? Um, now, my mother, on the other hand, uh, at the age of 15, she got uh, her very first job drawing blood, uh, a phlebotomist, if you will, for $15 a pop. Um, literally worked her way up the ladder to yeah. become a nuclear physicist on the board of Mercy Hospital. Recently, as of two years ago, retired after 53 years of gainful employment, second longest employer of Mercy Hospital's history. Incredible. Right? You know, my father was around just enough to let us know that he wasn't around. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, oddly enough, as fate would have it, in retrospect, looking back, I became that man. Right. Um, the apple doesn't fall far theory. And, and my brother, you know, he wanted to be an attorney his whole life. He by the time he passed the bar and he graduated law school, he was literally blinded in student debt. He had no idea what his next move was going to be or how he was going to get himself out of the position that he had created for himself. Uh, and, and I can tell you that today, currently, he's an attorney. Um, that, that works in the White House practicing pensions and benefits. Um, <laughs> me, on the other hand, I was... I was... It sounds incredible on that side. Yeah, and then it's... <laughs> boom, Brandon. Fucking, fucking aces. <laughs> then you have this. Yeah. <laughs> um, the at, the age, at the age of seven, I was truly blessed... With, with being gifted my first skateboard. And that night when my mother put me to bed, she said, Brandon, what would you like me to do with your skateboard? And, and I said, I want it in bed with me. And she said, why? I said, because if I die, I want it to come with me. It, it was like the day that I received that board, that moment that the wood touched my hand, I knew I was going to be a professional skateboarder. That there was no reason for a plan B, a trait, or an option. I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, I dreamt it. At the age of 14, I'm the first skateboarder ever in the world to be endorsed by Gatorade. Um, they're flying me to Chicago to the Quake Roads building where they make Gatorade at the time. And, and they're putting me on this treadmill and they're putting Michael Jordan on a treadmill directly next to me. And, and they're strapping these EKGs to our chest uh, and giving us each Gatorade to see the effects that it has on different sports players. At the age of 15, I'm designing my, my pro model for Pal Peralta. Uh, I'm touring the world with Tony Hawk. I have a private tutor that flies with. So, so a trait that I possessed then that clearly followed into my addiction that maybe you can relate to is, is that despite any and all adverse consequences that came my way, I did what I had to do to get what I wanted to get. Always. 
you know. Then I can relate to that. Uh, when you started talking and you said that, if I'd asked you that question three years ago, uh, that, that you know the whole family thing, and you know after 28 years of using, I went to treatment, and when I had to do my life story, the life story had like car crashes and explosions. It was such bullshit. But you know, it was what I believed, and you know, I blamed my father for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then over the course of like the next two years, three years, I found out that my father was actually 30 years sober. And I never ever knew because I was too busy hating him on him for telling me the truth. And, you know, and as he, and I remember going to see my dad and I said to my dad, I really need to, this was when I was six months clean. I said, dad, uh, you know, I'm really sorry for everything I put you through. And my dad was like, why don't you fuck off and come back to me when you're six years? And I just thought, wow. What a horrible thing to say, but you know what? My dad, it was a legacy because at six years I got on my knees and asked for help again and changed my life because, you know, I worked this program and I was so full of misideas and mistruths that I never allowed uh, for that bond to ever happen between us. I can really relate to the fact that whatever situation I'm in, I always have to look about surviving in that situation. Absolutely. I mean, the, the last thing that I ever wanted to do for myself and, and my addiction was take personal accountability to my <laughs> actions. How fucking dare I? You know, it, it, it was the parole officer's fault because, uh, you know, she gave me a piss test that was faulty and it came up hot. <laughs> it, it, it was the judge's fault because, like, his wife made him sleep on the couch the night before, so he was yeah. lengthy with yeah. my head. It, 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 was, it was my fiance's fault, my ex-fiance's fault, because she, she got off of work early, and if she would have came home 20 minutes later, I could have shot my dope in peace without getting caught. It was, I, I, never, I, I never wanted to take personal accountability for my actions. Right. That, that didn't work well for a day in the life of an addict called Brandon Novak. No. I so, think that kind of just goes into, I think that's for the majority of addicts, you know, responsibility is such a massive word. I was responsible for one thing and one thing only, surviving that day. Everybody else who came into my life or got in my way that day was just was there to annoy me. Do you get what I'm saying? It was like- 100%. You know, I got to that point in life where I believe we are the same, was that my life consisted uh, of finding ways and means to get more. I lived to use and I used to live. And, and, and unfortunately, Anything that came between me and that bag, that bottle, that pill, it must and will go. And it's not personal. It's just business for the game that we play called addiction. Relationships, work, you know, anything that comes in between us, getting what we want, just it doesn't exist to me anymore. You know, oh. it, 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 was, it was anything that was a, a game changer. Just wasn't Well, that's it, right? Because, you know, for... For 24 years of active addiction, right? I, I, I kept the needle on my arm for 21. I kept the bottle on my mouth for a grand total of 24 years of, of active addiction minus one year due to incarceration. So that was by force, not by choice that I took a time out. Yeah. Um, you know, in 24 years of active addiction, uh, I became so disconnected from reality and or abnormality that, that I lived on that animalistic level. Right. So so the norm of waking up, brushing your teeth, going to work, uh, paying your mortgage, paying your rent, going to the grocery store was a fucking waste of time for me. I couldn't grasp why you would want to do that. But you know what? Didn't it get to the stage at some point where you were you were still making a career out of being that car crash? Absolutely. And, you know, because as, as, as my fate would have it for me, I, I, I tripped and I fell into those movies, Jackass and, and these TV shows, Viva La Bam. And, and what perfect line of work for an alcoholic and an addict, because uh, the more, the more, the more outrageous my behaviors were, the more outlandish my antics had come, the higher in demand I was because the ratings were bigger. So it was a fucking perfect fit for an addict. Exactly the same with me. For me, it was the open, I, I, cause I DJ, and um, I would, I created this persona of being the biggest car crash mess there was. And people were paying to see that in their clubs. I would turn the music off, cause fights. I would turn, yeah. turn the music off and say, no K, no play. And people would bring me ketamine. <clears throat> and, and you know, that was what, that was what the product was. That's the, the brand. 
And that's why, and you know, and it was getting from that point of that brand of destruction and being paid to be that, that mess and that car crash was, I could, the only way out of that was death for me. Yeah. I never ever thought that getting clean would be an option. I just and thought, okay, I'm going to die this way. That's what makes it so hard for people like you and I, entertainers, to get sober, right? Because here, check this out, peep this. Uh, we have both been, I believe, in, in many of attempts uh, of many times getting sober in many treatment centers, they, they've diagnosed you and I as an addict or an alcoholic. Nice. And what I'm about to say is not debatable. There's no reason for anybody to message me later and say that, <laughs> that what, no, we're not going to fucking do that. If you're diagnosed as an addict or an alcoholic, all that simply means is that we have been diagnosed with a disease that if left untreated equals death. It's a fact. There's I'm nothing to debate. There. There's no argument. But there's no argument. But as far as I'm aware of, we, Tony, you and I, have been diagnosed with, as far as I'm aware, we have been diagnosed with, with the only fatal disease that will lie to us on a daily basis in our own voice and tell us that we don't have this disease. Follow me. Diagnose me with HIV. I'm rushing to the hospital to get medication. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me with cancer. I'm rushing to the hospital to get chemo. I don't want to die. Fatal disease. Diagnose me as an addict or an alcoholic. I need a glass of wine or a bag of heroin to figure out what the fuck's wrong with you for diagnosing me with said disease. Just as fatal as the first two diseases, but no. left to my own devices. I'll believe as soon as we finish this talk that I don't have that disease. I'll close my computer, go to the ATM, pull out a grip of cash because I have it today uh -huh. because I'm not getting high, and go buy some dope. And the scary thing is that I can make that make complete sense to me. See, all both both of those other diseases and the one we're talking about at the moment. I've had all three, and you know I was in hospital with both of those other two diseases. And both the times that I was in hospital, dying, and I mean literally dying, and being do diagnosed with that. Uh, I was on no forms of medication. I was outside the hospital waiting for dealers to arrive at two a.m. with drips in my arm. Nothing could stop sure. with the third one. When it came to being diagnosed as an addict, you know. There was there was no stopping me. I you know, I knew I was going to die, and I, I, there was always destruction. With the other two, they're always treatable. I could get on a course of medication. I could take this. I could do that, and they always gave me the will to live. When I was diagnosed, and I knew in myself that I was an addict, all bets were off. Right. So wrong. see, we're paired, we're paired with the fact that we have this disease that lies to us in our own voice. It makes us believe the unbelievable. Paired with the fact that when I put my hand up and I say, hi, my name is Brandon. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah. All that means is that I'm defiant by nature. I hate authority and I will never fucking conform unless it becomes my idea. Why is that? Because I possess this job that consists of knowing everything. So thank you, Tony, for giving me some suggestions, but I'm going to politely tell you to fuck off because I believe that I know, right? Here, in fact, now that I've created this entity, the more outrageous my behaviors are, the more outlandish my antics are, the higher my ratings go, the more in demand I become, the more money I make, I now do appearances in nightclubs. They say, okay, Mr. Novak, what would you like in your green room on your rider? I'd say some heroin, some cocaine, some Xanax, and some wine. They get me the substances. I take pictures, sign autographs. At the end of the night, I receive a check for $10,000. You tell me my life is unmanageable. I believe that my life is unmanageable, but my bank account seems pretty fucking manageable. I remember going to Hong Kong once, and I got there, and there was no, no cocaine on the island. There'd been like some major drama gone on and, and they, I all I could get was pills ease and I did I did three days of ease and fucked off back to England <laughs> set fire to a hotel room woke up in A&E covered in iodine they painted me orange because I'd set fire to it smoking trying to smoke pills like yeah. insanity insanity because <laughs> the pills were no longer working I know I'll smoke them yeah, I, I, I remember I had these Valiums one time and I couldn't get what I wanted, which was heroin. Yeah. So I get all these Valiums and I have my needle and, and I don't want to waste the Valiums <laughs> because I'm thinking that maybe I'll try to cook them up and bang them, but I don't want to waste them if I cook them. Will they jet? So I call 911 <laughs> and I say to 911, I think my roommate just shot up a whole bunch of Valiums. Is that even possible? Hopefully it will give me the answer. You know what I mean? But see, that's the abnormal. So that's disconnected from reality and normality. Because that we makes have, sense to me. You and I suffer from the same thing. We have uncommon sense. 100%. Like, 
you know, and I, and I share this all the time when I do talk on common sense, you know, common sense is like, okay, I've got a really big job tomorrow. I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to get up. My uncle says, is, why don't you get an eighth of coke in for tomorrow? Why would you go to sleep? Work? Yeah. <laughs> get it in. You got it for when you get home from work. Oh, just have one night. The eighth's gone. It's 9 a.m. You got to go and do that job. You get to that job. They send you up there. Sorry, we can't work with you. You're too out of it. And then I will stand there for an hour arguing with them. What do you mean I'm out of it? How dare you tell me I'm out of it? How dare Just you stop With odd shoes on. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, you, how dare you? You know, insult me. I haven't done drugs in years. Insane. The insanity. But my head will tell me that's okay. That's reality. Well, see, that's the scary part about the disease that you and I possess, right? Because I remember distinctly, as you were saying that, it, it painted this picture for me. Uh, my, my best friend, Bam Margera, him and I are in New York City. We, we have to do the Howard Stern show. And we have to be there at like 6.30 a.m. So that clearly says that we're going to get cocaine and stay up because oh, like oh. if we go to sleep, we might not wake up. We wake up. <laughs> Make complete sense. We get the cocaine. We stay up all night. I go in. We do the show. And, and, and I like... Richard Christie, I licked his his hemorrhoid asshole um, and did some other shit. And, and we got the second highest ratings behind friends. <laughs> so my mind tells me that I'm a successful addict, right? There you go. Yeah, totally. You're functioning. Which only really hurt me as opposed to help me when I went to treatment, right? Because I felt that I was so internally unique. Yes, I get that it works for you, but but you didn't watch your father slit your mother's throat at the age of eight, right? At the age of seven, your father didn't take you to the strip joint. And when he was in the back conducting business, he didn't sit you at the bar store as the pretty dancing girls would pour shots of ginger ale and Coca-Cola in the glass. You do the shots, the girls applaud, your father gives you that look. Of you didn't end up in movies that broke box office records that allowed you to get high without repercussions. So like, I get that it's great for you, but it yeah. cannot work for me and i believe that yeah exactly i believe that for many years until you know I, I got to a point in my life ignorance is bliss when you don't know you're not to be held accountable but i i had did the wrong thing one too many times yeah. and what that what i mean by that is is i continue to check myself into treatment centers and, and a few of those attempts i actually successfully completed my 30 day stays and i would successfully treat sit through a whole aa or na meeting yeah. and now the worst thing for an addict is, is to try to cut a bag of dope with some na or, yeah. or, or try to drink a glass of wine cut with aa it doesn't quite fucking sit right no. so now as I couldn't see this at the time, but now having been sober long enough, having had that spiritual experience, I can look back and recognize the synchronicity in life's events that have led me to the here and now. So I can clearly see where I was having these spiritual experiences throughout my journey. <laughs> And I can look back and recognize that that each one of those attempts, although at the time I believe were a fucking utter failure, were really a, a success that well, all led. They were planting the seeds, Brandon. They were each exactly. It dug a little bit deeper. It dug a little bit deeper. You know, for me, I went away for six months. I was in treatment for six months. Uh, I did three months this last time. And you know, and and, and that when I came out. I thought, oh, you know, I know it all, there is to know, let go, let God, you know, all of that shite. I literally went six months without discussing the S word. I didn't mention once that I was a sex addict. Sure. And what I was, over the course of the next few years, that, that got so far greater than any other drug that I ever took and completely destroyed my life in recovery. Wow. Because I, I was so focused on, yeah, the badge of honor, of, yeah, I'm clean, I'm not, yeah, I'm, so what if I do that? I'm clean. So what if I do this? I'm clean. And you know, like you, I would, the first three months of coming into, re, like trying to get into recovery, I would change dealers. All my friends would go to the same dealer and I, they'd go there and they'd say, have you seen Tony? And they'd be like, no, he's, he's got clean. And all I'd done was change dealers. But you know, that was my theory of like, oh, they're all gonna think I'm clean. No one's gonna know because I changed dealers. And then I would go to my other dealer's house after relapsing and I would sit there and talk about NA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. 
Two days, solid. And he'd be like, yeah, the day you get clean, you can change people's lives. I'm trying to like, just get me out of his house. You know, it's like, I was like the Mormons knocking on your door at yeah. people's houses. That was the thing, right? I'm nobody's fool, right? I come from better, I know better. I pride myself on being a pretty intelligent individual that's an mm -hmm. outside of the box thinker. So, so I was that fucking star student that could go in there and run groups, right? I could yeah. fuck. I could quote the, the big book of AA, the basic text of Narcotics Anonymous, through and through, right? You'd think I was an employee of the facility. <laughs> the reality is, is I didn't lack the knowledge. I lacked the action behind the knowledge. And, and again, what I say, because I, I, I do the deal now, right? Like I have a sponsor, I have sponsees, I, I, I experience the steps. Um, and, and, and what I tell my sponsees is that, that I don't give a fuck if you know. That's actually the problem. The, the problem is that you believe that you know, when in hindsight and reality, what you do know is that you have no fucking idea, but you yeah. haven't realized that yet, right? Because that's the realization I walked into, right? Walked into my 13th inpatient treatment center. Now I see it for what it was. I, I'm not clever enough to paint myself in this picture for what you see me in. Left to my own devices, meaning... Brandon attends Brandon's Anonymous, Brandon sponsors Brandon, and Brandon is Brandon's guy. I'll put this whole fucking place into it. No, I, I was doing the 12 steps of Fat Tony. You yeah. Know, as Fat Tony sees it. Absolutely. So now, seeing it for what it really was, is I'm not clever enough. You name it, I, I, I've, I've moved all over the United States. I've moved to, to London, I moved to Paris, I moved to Finland, I changed women, homes, careers, all in hopes to lift this obsession and rid me of the desire because a lot of the time I didn't wanna do what I was doing. I really didn't. Um, and the reality is, is, is no human power could ever get me sober or keep me sober. So now I see it for what it really was. Yeah. May 25th, 2015, I had just woken up from being on life support for seven days. And all that simply was, is the God of my understanding divinely inconveniencing me in just such a manner to create a big enough gap between that life support bed that I was on to walking into that 13th facility. And I walk into the 13th facility and, and I literally, I'm a 38 year old man who, who has done some things that people would equate to success or happiness and, and potentially even dream of doing, right? At, at the age of 14, I'm the first skateboarder endorsed by Gatorade. I'm, I'm hanging out with Michael Jordan. At 15, I'm touring the world with Tony Hawk. I'm designing my pro model. Um, later on down the line, I, I end up in those movies, Jackass and these TV shows, Viva La Bam. A little bit further down the road, I, I write this book that becomes a New York Times top 10 seller, an autobiography addiction memoir all while sniffing copious amounts of fucking cocaine and drinking uh, endless amounts of red wine. <laughs> I'm now receiving hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail from all over the world of, of people like you saying, Novak, I read your book. I didn't want my story to get as bad as yours. I have 30 days. People like uh, her mother saying, I read your book. I understand why my daughter's an addict. It's not that I was a bad mom. It's that she suffers with a disease of addiction. My delusional alcoholic brain interpreted that as I just wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or the basic text of Narcotics Anonymous. Uh -huh. And I truly really fucking believed it. So if you think that I'm going to walk into a facility and hear what the fuck you have to say when I'm a New York Times selling author who's written a book on addiction, fuck you. But I walked in that 13th facility and, ego, and I literally... Ego, ego. All e easing God out. Brandon is Brandon's God. I fucking got this. Um, and I walk into that 13th facility. The God of my understanding guides and directs me into that facility now, seeing it for what it was. I walk in there, and this is what I own. At 38 years old, treatment center number 13, just woken up from being on life support for seven days. My mother has bought me a plot. People have taken life insurance policies out on me. Uh, I, I reside on the corner of Eastern Avenue in Baltimore City, prostituting my body to secure enough funds to buy another bag of heroin. Um, and I walk into my 13th facility with the clothes on my back, uh, which look like this. It, it's a long story. I'm just going to tell you what I look like. I, I had tried to, to go score some dope, and, and the boys saw fit to rob me as opposed to serve me. Now, at this time, I'm a homeless addict who lives to use. I use to live. I, I prostitute my body during the day. I try to survive at night. Uh, and I'm, I go to buy this dope from these guys and they see fit to rob me as opposed to serve me. So I, I have uh, these at once point in time, nice pair of dress slacks. If you overlook the cigarette burns, cause I fall asleep. Um, I, I don't have underwear on because like I fucking am a homeless addict that shoots dope. I'm not gonna pretend yeah. like 
I'll wash these underwear and take yeah. care of them. Yeah. Fuck you. I, I live to you. <laughs> I, I, I have this button up shirt on and these at once point in time, nice Brooks Brothers shoes, but I lost one shoestring along the way. So when I go to cop from the boys, the boys see fit to rob me as opposed to serve me. When they rob me, they rip my front and my back pockets completely out. Now my dick and my ass are completely exposed. They rip my shirt open. The only button that stays button is this very top button. And I got these shoes on with one shoestring because I lost the other one while tying up. I'm literally roaming the streets of West Baltimore looking like a gay East LA Cholo gangbang. <laughs> I walk into my 13th treatment with that exact outfit on because I don't have the disease from which I possess on. the disease from which I possess that brought me through a fucking another treatment center begging to God for one more chance does not allow me to own a fucking change of clothes. Yeah. I, I keep my story very upfront, very descriptive, very graphic because the yeah. moment I forget where the fuck I come from, I will return on the, on the head. Exactly. I'm exactly the same. The more honest we are around where we come from and what, what it was like for us, the, the, we don't have any any preconceptions of what it what it was like. For me, I don't fantasize about how good my life was. I know how bad it was. I had no teeth. I had one tooth left. I bought yeah. them out with plastic yeah. and, and sticks. Yeah. Things. I had one pair of trainers that I'd stolen the night before from some guy's house, and that yeah. was all I had. But except for one thing that I did have on my side was the love of one other person that wanted me to survive. And that's how I got wow. treatment through that person's a gift of the gift of desperation was granted to me that day, and I, I took it. And and this person was in the right place at the right time, not by coincidence. It's, it's not coincidence. That person was there. That's higher power stuff. That's yeah. He was in that room at the right time, said the yeah. right thing to me at that precise right moment that changed my life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was up to that point now, Brandon. I wanted to kill myself on a minutely basis. Every minute. That's all I thought about was death, my funeral. Oh. I, I, I say the same thing. I wanted to kill myself on a daily basis. I just didn't want to hurt myself in the process of it. Oh, exactly. Right? So I walk into that treatment center. Oh. I'm a 38 year old successful man and a lot of rights. In reality, I, I have the clothes on my back, I have this, this duffel bag that I carry in my hand. That, that doubles as a pillow. And in this bag are my worldly belongings. And this is all I own. Eight scarves, two, uh, eight, eight scarves, two shirts, three socks, one stick of deodorant, uh, a, a needle, a spoon, and a restraining order that my mother just had served <laughs> with me to get the fuck out of her house. And I walk in there and there's this 19 year old tech working. And he said, Mr. Novak, you're back. And I said, aren't you a fucking genius? You don't miss a beat, do you, boy? So much humility. Yeah, because he's happy, right? He's experienced this program, and there's nothing happy in my life, right? And I don't, he said, Mr. Novak, I regret to inform you, but your clothes are not rehab-oriented. You need some underwear. You need some sweatpants. And the fact of the matter, I don't own those articles of clothing. He said, come downstairs to the basement, and we're going to go to the donations room, and we're going to see if we can find you some, some used underwear. My mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother's an attorney in the White House. I've hung out with Michael Jordan, toured the world with Tony Hawk, in movies that break box office records. New York Times selling author that's written a book on addiction. I'm now a 38-year-old man standing in my 13th treatment center. I've just woken up from being on life support. As this 19-year-old text thumbs through these boxes looking for a pair of second, third, fourth, fifth-hand pair of underwear, and I'm praying to God that he finds them. How the fuck did I get there? I got there. Yeah, I got there because I sat here and I possessed that job that consisted of knowing everything. I got there because I sat here and I compared out with a closed mind and a closed heart. And our here's ego, what happened. Our egos will take us to that place. 100%. We end up when we live in that, in that place of ego and fear of no one knowing who we are. How can we go there? How can we say this? Because we're going to be judged for who we are. We create this level. Oh, of, absolutely. You know, and it's about going in there and, and it's that acceptance of, Okay, this is this is it. This is where I ended up. This is it, right? For the first time in our lives, like we started about in the beginning, taking responsibility for our actions, the thing that we had avoided for years, because that does not work well in a day of shooting dope with me. You know? So 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 I'm in the basement and literally at this day, May twenty fifth, twenty fifteen, if you added the word less 
to every word in the English dictionary. That's what I had become. Yeah. And, and there was no human word that could suffice to have how fucking bad I felt about my life. I was hopeless. I was helpless. I was depressed. You name it. And, and, and all of a sudden, unbeknownst to me, the terms of my contract were forever changing at that moment. And I had no idea. As this kid thumbs through these boxes looking for used underwear. I'm praying to God that he, doesn't, that he finds them. He doesn't find them. But what he, what he finds is, is a pair of, 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 of women's sweatpants size 40 with no drawstring, a woman's tank top, and a pair of size 13 Jesus sandals. I'm not a woman, uh, and I don't wear a size 13. But, but what happened was, for the first time in my life that I know now, looking back, I see it happen many times before, but for the first time in my life that I can remember, I have come face to face with my higher power. Mm -hmm. I've now had a direct face to face meeting in a form of, and you said it, gift of desperation. The pain had become so fucking great that not only was I willing to accept the women's clothing from this kid, I was never so excited and eager to wear them in my life. That was the first thing that happened, right? My mind had become open-minded and now I'm willing to follow the suggestions, Tony, because you've been sober for some time, right? All as a direct result of enough pain. And the second thing that happens after 24 years of possessing that job that consists of knowing everything, I came to the realization that, you know what I do know? Is that I don't fucking know. And my very best thinking places me in positions like this time after time. So for the first time in my life, I came to the realization that the common denominator in my problems were me. I simply got the fuck out of my way, followed your suggestions, Tony. For the first time in my life, I walked into a treatment center with absolutely no plan. And that lack of plan, guess what? Has produced the best of plans. So you're five years now, which is fucking insane. Yeah. You know, it, it really is. It, you know, uh, I've got, I, I, my partner at the moment is 60 days clean. Oh. And, and, you know, I've been with him for eight years. And that 60 days of magic in the house is just oh. insane. You know, it, look, it makes my hair stand on it. Because, you know, that gift that they get given, that desperation, it, you can smell it in the air. It's insane. And I just think that, you know, when we get that clean time and clean time, everyone, you know, you get all these old times. They say clean time don't mean jack shit. Clean time does. If you tell if, that to my mother. Exactly. Thank you. And, you know, recovery is one of the most amazing things that, that we ever, we will ever, ever encounter in our lives, regardless of films and book deals and everything else. Recovery, that gift that we get given that we, when we, when we choose and we, we, take it on and accept it, we can do anything. I, I tell people all the time, right? Walking into that 13th facility, right? I, I, I sat in, in this particular facility, I had attempted to, 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 to uh, you know, to, to successfully complete four previous times out of 13 attempts, right? And I'm sitting in the same chair with the same intake coordinator as the four previous times. And this is how that conversation always looked. Okay, Mr. Novak, your insurance will cover 90 days. And I would say, in theory, 90 days sounds great. But in re reality, I'm more of a 45-day kind of fella <laughs> because I have this woman to do, this job to fulfill, and this yeah. state to go to. And each and every time, she'd gently laugh at me and say, sweetheart, you have no idea. Anything and everything that you put in front of your recovery does not matter because you will lose it. Right. May 25th, 2015 something changed. Something changed. For the first time in my life, I was finally demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol. I had been beaten into that state of reasonableness that when she said to me the same thing she had said four previous times, okay, Mr. Novak, your insurance covers 90 days. When she gave me that offer, I, for the first time in my life, could not come back with a counter offer. Not because I couldn't think of anything to say, but simply because the pain was so great, I had been beaten so hard that all I could do was shake my head yes. Because if I said no, that entailed an explanation as to why I couldn't stay for 90. And she said, sweetheart, you're, for the first time in my life, I was beaten speechless by my disease of addiction. And thank fucking God, because mm -hmm. my mouth and my words were rubbish, man. Yeah. She said, you're in no condition to do your intake. Get up to detox. I'll see you in four days. 
I'm, I'm, I'm barely making it up to detox. I got my gay East LA Cholo gangbanger outfit on, my dick swinging in the wind. I got my belongings in my hand, a needle, a spoon, a restraining order, and eight scarves, doubles as a pillow. And I see my therapist, who I still see today privately, because you people told me, stick to the basics, kids, so God willing, you never have to go back to the basics. Well, I took that shit real serious. Christina stopped me in my tracks. She said, Brandon, you're back. I said, yeah. She said, if you play your cards right today, May 25th, 2015, gay East LA Cholo outfit, needle spoon, restraining order, want to kill myself, don't want to hurt myself in the process. She looked at me. She said, if you play your cards right today, right now, could be the best day of your life. And she kept walking. And I said, I said, Christina, do you need a fucking urinalysis? You know who I am. You know what I'm capable of producing out of life. I stand before you fucking looking insane. I can tell you from my heart of hearts, Tony, May 25th, 2015, that day that I perceived as being lower than hell, wanting to kill myself, didn't want to hurt myself in the process, yeah. fucked for the end all be all, has turned out to be the best day of my life. It far surpasses New York Times selling author. It far surpasses movies, skateboarding. That day, that worst day of my life has given me my the best life I could have ever, I couldn't imagine this. You know, when you get clean, people say to you, oh, you're gonna get a life beyond your wildest dreams. And you know, <laughs> straight away, in those early days, you think, oh, I'm gonna have a brand new house, I'm gonna get a car and all this stuff. And as we go on and we learn, you know, a life beyond our wildest dreams means freedom. It means self-respect. It means it means so much more than materialistic stuff. That comes that comes later. You were this program. You know, I can go anywhere in the world and do what I do for my career, and I can come home and I can put my head on the pillow with knowing that my day has been full of joy. Life and life terms is fucking hard. But you know what? I have the tools to deal with it today. Recovery's given me those tools to know that I'm having a shit day doesn't mean I need to drink a bottle of Jack Daniels or I'm having a shit day doesn't mean that I have to abuse 30 people. You yeah. know, it's my behaviours and that has given me one thing and one thing only, the responsibility to be me. Do you go and thank you? Because <laughs> yeah. I never had that before. No, no. And it's not an easy fucking, it's not an easy task to fulfil. Right, because here's the deal. Uh, the first time I'm going through detox and I don't have my solution, right? Because my solution is my heroin. The problem is my brain, my thinking, my attitude, my behavior. I'm now going through detox without my solution. I'm like a stranger on my own skin trying to figure out who the fuck let me in and why. And I don't have my solution, right? And, and now I finally... Through the grace of God, I get sober, I stay sober, I experience the 12 steps, I have this spiritual experience. Yeah. And, and, and what I've come to understand is I've done the internal work that was required to get the external results that were always desired, right? I, from 16 years old to 35, I was on parole and probation. Never a free day in between. It just followed me from state to state. On my... 20, 22 month uh, sober date, I signed my release papers. I literally became a free man that could go anywhere with anybody, anytime that I like. I decided I was gonna go to Paris to an alcohol anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting to get my, my two year medallion. Because what I understood is that I no longer lived in this self-induced prison that consisted of a four block radius that cost me $10 to get out of one bag of heroin at a time. I can go any fucking where with anybody and do anything I like. I, I, I'm a firm believer that in recovery, there is no such word as I can't. Two yeah. words, I can't, you can, you can do absolutely anything. If you want to use, use, you, you know, you're, that's your fuck up. But you know what, you can do anything when you put your mind to it. As addicts, we, you know, we spend our whole life you know, working out our, our game plan of, of, of survival and game plan of manipulation and game plan of how we're going to rule the world, but, you know, and, and get all the drugs we want and live like that. But you know what? We, when we turn that into a positive thing, and we, we, we suddenly channel all of that negativity into positivity. We can do what we fucking want. We can, we can be who we want to be. That's the promise that's the promises of the program. They told me that, that if I changed my perception, I could change my world and that my defects could become my assets. 
Yeah. And that's all that we're simply doing right here. We're taking what's, what was once our defect and turning it into an asset, right? Because how I started this, my name is Brandon. I'm an alcoholic. All that means I'm defiant by nature. I hate authority. I'll never conform unless it becomes my idea, right? Our defects, two hopeless fucking junkies who could not make it a day without using are now years in recovery, sharing about their trials and tribulations, overcoming all adversities that came our way. God willing, there's going to be one person like your partner or your partner's friends that will watch this and say, you know what? If Novak and Tony can do it, there's no reason why I can't. And guess what happens? Because we're defiant by nature, we hate authority, we'll never conform. Unless what? It becomes our idea. Now they watch this, defects turn to assets, it becomes their idea. Guess what? We excel at a rapid fucking pace. <laughs> and you know what? The amount of messages we get from these programs on, on a daily basis, I literally untold i mean i get 30 to 40 messages on a good on, on on any morning from people that have watched this or watched other recovery stuff that i've done and you know what my life is always about music and it's always been about like you know oh building this brand of the, of the dj and, and they, that shit means jack shit on the bigger picture this is where i i feel more comfortable you know why because i'm being fucking honest when i'm yeah. djing and i'm traveling the world doing that stuff through that job i suffer with imposter syndrome this is the only area of my life I don't feel like an imposter. Yeah. I don't feel like an imposter in recovery. I yeah. feel like I, there's no fake, there's no part of me that just thinks, you can't do this. You can't do that anymore. Because I work this program, this program has given me the tools that enables me to go and do my job, go to a club, DJ to 20,000 20, people, 2,000 people, and be in that environment and not be tempted by that environment. Because that, the environment never, was never the problem. I was no. a problem. They, they, I would go to rehab and they would talk about triggers, right? Yeah. And, 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 and after doing enough work on myself, uh, I, I've come to understand that for me, you know, you, if you want to know what my trigger is, it's simply when my eyelids open. I can justify why any time, place, oh. feeling, or sensation makes sense to shoot dope. 100%. You know, for me today, I, uh, I, I will... The thought of using or drinking doesn't come into my head anymore. Oh. What does is, okay, today's a really good day to do A, B, or C, or D to destroy your life. Because I don't need a drink or a drug to destroy my life. I do a fucking good job of that on my own. I left Absolutely. when I'm in self, I'm fucked. But, you know, yeah. by doing this stuff and reaching out, talking, working with sponsors, or even just picking up the phone or answering texts, it takes me out of self. And what, because that's where I need to be. About an hour before us jumping on here, I received some some news that 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 uh, that literally took the wind out of my sails. And, and when the news was given to me by by a, one could call it a boss, I choose to call him a mentor. Yeah. He said, "Are you sitting down?" And when this man says that, something's yeah. and when I got it, I, I still can't process it, wrap my head around it, and I thought, "Fuck." Fuck me! I have to do this, and 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 right, self doubt, self hatred, uh, me, right? I'm the problem, and I'm talking myself. I said maybe I should postpone it, prolong it. And the reality is, in doing this, I, I, I've I've felt more me than I felt prior to getting on here. I I felt like I can breathe. You know, we spend so much time being, oh, it's my problem. It's why me? Why? Why is my life? You know, the therapeutic value of me talking to you and you talking to me is on president. I get so, I'm, I'm going to come away from this feeling so good because, not because I think, oh, it wasn't as bad as, it, you know, my life wasn't as bad as him, but the fact that I relate to everything that you right. say, everything that you've done, I've done in different ways. And it's taken us all to the same place, a place of nothing, where we yeah. are, have what we, you know, that thin line between life and death. Yeah. And today, it's not like that. Today, it's about life. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that things happen for a reason. Absolutely. It's never, it's never a con you know, it's never a coincidence that people come into your life for the right reasons. You know, something, you know, you could be sitting in a police cell and thinking, oh my God, but how did I get here? And then three, uh, three years later, you'll look back on that and just think about what some, some beautiful thing that happened from that reason, that place yeah. that you're in. You would know with your dick hanging out, yeah. going into that treatment center and now you're five years clean that is that is, that's not luck that's 
no, no. Those are two. Those words are two of my biggest pet peeves. Luck and coincidence. I fucking can't stomach it. I believe everything is destiny and fate. Hundred um, percent. Prime example of that. I'm in my very first treatment center at the age of 17. I go there to prove a point to my mother and then girlfriend why this is simply an overreaction at best. You just caught me at a bad time on a bad way in a bad day. I can drink and drug successfully. I go in the treatment center at 17. Uh, it's the first treatment center I, I've entered in Baltimore City. My mother and my girl dropped me off. They, they, and, and it's around 1030 at night. And, and they put me in this cafeteria. And in this cafeteria, it's completely empty. And there's these big, like, interrogation-style lights shining on me. I'm ill as a research monkey. I'm detoxing from heroin. Um, and, and out of nowhere, this older black gentleman walks in. I can tell you where the four teeth were placed in his mouth because at the time I had all mine. Yeah. Of nowhere he walks in and he says, white boy, what are you doing here? I said, heroin. He said, how are you? I said, 17. He said, do yourself a favor and don't turn 18 in a place like this. As quick as he came, he left. He had no idea the significance of this conversation was ever going to have on me. I can tell you where the four teeth were placed in his mouth because at the time I had all mine. He's black. I'm white. He's 70 to 75. I'm 17. He smokes crack. I successfully do heroin. Yeah. He's homeless. I live with my mother and my girlfriend. God bless that man. I'm so grateful he found the answer for which he's in search of. 13 treatment centers, 12 treatment centers later, May 2015. I walk into my now second ex-fiance's home. She's completely packed the home up. She's taken the furniture, the paintings, uh, our cats, our clothing. She completely ran, right? And she ran, she got a new place. And I found myself in, in a position that you might be able to relate to. I found myself in a fetal position, lying on this floor, crying uncontrollably. And it dawned on me. This home is now a spitting image of what I have become. This big empty shell of a house now consoles this big empty shell of a man who's lying on the floor in a fetal position crying uncontrollably. And the only person that's dancing through my mind is that black gentleman from my very first treatment center at 17. And I fucking paid no mind to it. I thought to myself at that time, what a fool this old man is. Why didn't he get himself together? I had a similar situation where I was, I was, I was in hospital and I, uh, I had, uh, I was really ill. I mean, I had like 60, 70 cells left. I was waiting outside the hospital for the dealer to come. It was at 2 a.m. in the morning and I was begging and begging. I was, you know, I would only pray to God when I wanted the dealer to arrive or for the dealer yeah. to give me tick. So that you, oh, please let him give me, a, let, let me, you know, let me, let him take me this. I've got no money. Let him get here and I'll get it off of him. I'll manipulate him. And that was when I would pray. And I was praying, I was praying and praying, thinking, please hurry up before they come and get me and take me back in the hospital. And along walks this girl that I used to party with. Me and her were inseparable. Her name's Julie. And me and her were inseparable. And we were everywhere together for years. And she walks along towards me and I was like, thank you, God, thank you, God. And she was wearing white, it was like an angel. And she says this, and she walks towards me and I'm like, Julie. And she's like, what, Tony, what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh, don't worry about that. You know, have you got, like, have you got anything? I, I, and she's like, what, what, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm in the hospital, but don't worry, you know, I'm all right. I, have, you, have you got any drugs on you or have you got any alcohol? And she was like, no. And she reached in her bag and I thought, thank fuck, she's gonna give me something. And she put a white key ring in my hand. And I remember looking at it and thinking, wow, what the fuck is that? And she went, get your ass to a meeting. Call me, I will take you. And I looked at it and I thought, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? I don't need this. And I remember going back in the hospital and I still had the white key ring today. And that key ring, now I got kicked out of houses, I lost houses, I lost it remained in a shoebox that I carried everywhere with me. Wow. Yeah, and I still had that key ring. You know, that stuck with me all my life, that, that key ring. Every time I used to think, oh, I can't do this anymore, I would think about that key ring. It was one of those magical moments, those moments that planted those seeds of hope. When we look back at it in hindsight, we just think, that was, that was, a, that was a, another gift from God. 
That yeah, really absolutely. Was, but at that, that moment, you're just like, what the fuck? Fuck off. Yeah, fuck off. What the fuck? I don't need this shit. But you know what? So let's bring it up to date. What's going on for you now, Brandon? What are you doing? I, I'm opening my first recovery house. Um, and, and because I lived in one for a year. Yeah. And, and I see the miracles and wonder that it did for me. My goal is, right, and we'll see what God thinks of it, is, um, is to open up, uh, I hate the word chain or franchise, but, but open up a series of Novak's house nationwide. Amazing. Uh, and and uh, so in a perfect world, you know, I've acquired a home. We settle the 10th of September. Uh, I, I'm so extremely excited about that. Um, hold on, let me get you something real quick. So I just recently released um, my my second my my the, the 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 sequel to my first book, which was it was insanely successful, um, and uh, it was printed in its ninth edition. Um, right. 98% of authors write a book. It doesn't make it past their first. This was printed in its ninth edition. So this is the sequel, the long awaited sequel, the eight years in waiting sequel, yeah. um, the streets of Baltimore that, that came out, uh, not too long ago. Um, recently I published the first ever, uh, addiction graphic novel. Um, uh, because what I believe in, in this work that I, I've been assigned to through my higher power yeah. of advocacy um, is, is that there's no margin for error, yet it's impossible to do perfect. So I'm just trying to create all these different outlets to get the word out there to let people know that the disease of addiction is not a death sentence. Your no. history does not have to dictate your future. And as long as you're breathing, it's never too late. Uh, why? Because I'm a fucking spitting image of that. You are spit. Our defects have become our assets. Oh. You know, never. I think that the most important thing, the message that it's most important for most people to hear is the fact that never give up on anyone. That's it. As long as you're breathing, it's never too late, man. It's, it's too late. You know, I mean, I, at 43 years old, I, 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 so at, at the age of 15, I was designing my pro model skateboard. Uh, I decided it would be a good idea to take up shooting heroin full time. So my dream of becoming a pro skater d diminished, you know, it disappeared. Um, I just recently put out uh, a video part accompanying with my pro model skateboard, right? So, so my dreams have become a re reality. Lost Incredible. dreams have become awoken. Incredible. And you know, that's, that's the gift of recovery. And I, I, I'm blessed. To, I'm blessed to have spoken to you today. I really love the fact that you agreed to do this with us and you put your message out there because it's such an important one. I'm going to ask you one DJ question before I go. Yes. One tune, one track that lifts you to a highest place that you could possibly be lifted. Whenever you're feeling low or you're having a really bad day, that one track that changes the way you feel. Right now at this moment, because that changes depending upon my vibe, um, is uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Slow Cheetah. I knew it was going to be a chili pop, a pepper. No way. And that's not even my deal. I don't even I like them. Like that. I, seriously, I knew it was going to be a chili peppers. I just thought. That's, I'm, I'm telling you. I, I don't even care for them that much. But right <laughs> now, this is that. I swear to God. It's so it's, it's insane. Uh, slow Cheetah. Amazing. We're going to put it on our Spotify list, Brit. Brandon. Yeah. Big love, man. Thank you so much. This has done more. You know. A helps B helps A the most. And you've helped me more than I think you realize today by doing this because I was in a, in a very uh, uncharted territories way prior to getting onto this. Man, listen, like, when I'm in town, I'll come out, I'll check you out, I'll message you. I'll Same, I come out there often. So yeah, I, I love, see us, man. I'm my favorite, do you recognize that fella? Who is it? It's Charlie Chaplin or? No, it's, Pete, a, it's Oliver. Pete, Pete Doherty. Oh, you pee. Oh, it's pee. Oh, so I, 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 I don't I, recognize that. <laughs> so I'm pretty good. I'm friends with those guys, and that's one of my favorite bands ever. So I, huh? Do you, are you friends with Courtney Love? No, no, no. Never met her. But oh. I come out there often, man. So when oh, I do, please. Out. Message yeah. me anytime. Message me on Insta. Oh, I miss you. And let's Same. Go God bless. Same. Hey, Godspeed, man. God bless. Thank good. you so much.
See you later. Cheers, man.